hadron therapy. Um, but most people ask me what it is. So I was going to start by just giving you an outline of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a brief history of precision hadron therapy, what it is, how we got to where we are, the basic radiobiology, which I had a privilege to be involved in at the Bell Lab years ago, some clinical outcomes that are very significant to the field and current and future research opportunities which are numerous even today. So hadron, the word hadron actually comes from the Greek hadros. It means robust. And a hadron is any elementary subatomic particle that interacts strongly with other particles. This field we call hadron therapy first began here at Berkeley in 1938 when neutron beams were first used in cancer therapy by Dr. Lawrence and others, um, including um, many people here uh, at Berkeley Lab. So the charged hadron beams, which are protons and carbon, unlike the neutron, which is uncharged, they have more favorable depth dose interactions, which maximize at the end of the peak, we call the Bragg peak. And initially in Europe, there was some confusion regarding the terminology of hadron therapy. Back there, it meant only protons, but now it's more generally considered to mean all charged particles, including protons, carbon, or any ion that's charged. And what's most significant about these ions is that both macroscopic and microscopic differences exist in the physical properties of the various charged ion beams, and therefore they have different, different biological effects. So you say, well, why are people interested in this hadron therapy? Well, currently, as of um, December 2017, almost 175,000 people have been treated with this radiation locality. That's a lot of people. <laughs> and of the most are being treated with protons, 150 almost, 1,000. The 2,000 that were treated with helium here at Berkeley Lab um, were very significant, and I'll explain why later. Unlike the PION program, which was at Los Alamos actually for 1,100 patients, which fizzled rather soon in this uh, modality field. But carbon ions is a strong 21,000 people now. And other ions, which prim primarily the 433 are neon ions done here at Berkeley. So, I'm sorry this is really bad math, but I, it shows the point I want to make is that you can see that um, all the business end of this is happening in Europe and Asia, and North America, South America, African continents are all devoid of a carbon ion machine. You might think, that's really weird. You're telling me that they were in, this field was invented here in Berkeley, and the United States doesn't have a machine, and that's indeed the, the truth of it. And um, why is that? So what I'm going to try to address for you today is let you know why that happened and how it happened and how we're getting around it uh, and trying to change that. But let me just demonstrate a clinical result, which is why people are so excited about this field. This is um, a tumor called um, ACC, adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, cell carcinoma, and it happens in salivary glands. In our mouth, we have glands that secrete 
fluid which helps us swallow. And it turns out that they're very vulnerable if you had chewed tobacco or other things. You can actually get a tumor that's very uh, insidious. And frequently, people call me, uh, just recently, in just last December, a gentleman called. He had an ACC tumor. And he was told he could be, be treated with a surgery that would have to take half his face and maybe his right eye. And he wanted to know about carbon therapy. So I was able, actually, just to tell you the bottom line, to send him to Chiba. And he now is free of disease. And um, it's an anecdotal result, but it's not alone. In fact, he himself just wrote me an email last week that he himself is now referring people to Japan as well. And so it's really interesting because the insurance company that was a private company in the Northwest were, were willing to pay for this very expensive surgery, but not the reimbursement to the Japanese for his treatment. It actually, in this country, it would take an act of Congress to change and allow Medicare to cover a U.S. patient's treatment out of this country. So what this is, these are carbon living the fucking PET images, and it shows in pink where the tumor is. And this is a fusion of a CT and a PET image, so you can see the structure and the function that's going on here. And you can see, this is four months after treatment, how the tumor has completely gone away. There's just a trace that left that will eventually also go away from the experience that the people have had. And this is not only one group, this is worldwide, this is the best treatment to, for this tumor in the world. But where did it all begin? I told you it was invented here at Berkeley. This is a man you probably are all too young, most of you, to even know, have known. But it's, his name is Ernest Orlando Lawrence, and he's the gentleman for whom our laboratory is named. He came to Berkeley from Yale to become an associate professor of physics in 1928. And he invented the first successful cyclotron in 1931. Professor Lawrence and Stanley Livingston of uh, Berkeley uh, designed and constructed a 13 centimeter diameter cyclotron which literally fit in the palm of your hand to, to test the feasibility of the concept. <clears throat> and this, this is really quite an amazing uh, feat that he accomplished this. And um, he did it in these old Berkeley buildings which I thought you might enjoy seeing. <laughs> and you can see him here. He, he used an old, unused civil engineering lab and made his first cyclotron in that building. And then when he exceeded the capacity, he asked for land on the hill, and that's why the etiology of why we ended up on Berkeley Hill overlooking the, the uh, university. So they, the rad lab, as they called it back then, was established within the physics department and with him as director. And it eventually became the E.O. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So here is the photo, oh, I'm sorry it got pixelated, but it shows him receiving his Nobel Prize in Sweden. Uh, he got that in 1939, when he was on the cover of Time magazine. Now he had a brother, John, who was a physician. And Ernest and John were very close, and he, he worked a lot, as you may know, on the um, protection of our country through the war effort. And so he um, wanted also to help other people besides working on the war. So he engaged his brother to come and join him at Berkeley Lab to help a way to apply these different things he was inventing to help him in biomedicine. And here was the first big accelerator we made. It's called the 184 inch accelerator. It's now been taken over by the advanced light source, just the frame of it. But it was the first large machine that he built here he is at the control panel. And they worked out of a laboratory that was named the Donor Laboratory from a donor. And um, his name was Joseph William Donner. And he, that's the origin of Donner Laboratory. So they worked together very strongly. And actually, John uh, uh, retained the reputation as becoming the father of nuclear medicine from his many pieces of work. And um, here, this is John with Dr. Stone, Robert Stone, treating with neutrons, a patient with a thyroid uh, tumor. But the gentleman that I'd like to introduce you to is this man, 
His name is Cornelius Tobias. When I came as a young PhD to Berkeley Lab, he hired me in 1975. And he, he already had a reputation from having worked with John, who's here in the picture, as they put a frame around this patient's head to hold it steady for the treatment. And he was very famous for his bow tie. Um, he, he himself was from Hungary, and he knew biology as well as physics. So he asked if I could help him with the biology. He was also working with a man named Robert Wilson, who first proposed the use of the bright peak from the radiation, for radiation, radiation therapy in 1946. This was him on his wedding day. And here, oops, I'm sorry. I think I lost it. Yes, OK. Um, I was trying to point. This is a side view of how the Bragg peak might treat a lung tumor, for example. The whole concept was to spare the normal tissue in front of the tumor and behind the tumor using this kind of physics, which is quite different from photons. So this is he later in life. He was still active back then. Um, when they finally made accelerators that would go to high enough energies to penetrate a human body uh, deeper, then they built the Bevelac. And there are many gentlemen here in the room who are uh, users and developers of that facility. Uh, this is Dr. Tobias and others at Lofton. As the, at the press re coverage announcing the acceleration of the first heavy ions at the Bevatron. So what about these right peaks and what, how did we get to proton and carbon only? So that's the story I want to tell you. So here is a Bragg curve and these are relative ionization doses as a function of depth in water. And you'll notice the proton, which is the dashed line, is 160 MeV and the carbon is 260. And it's because the carbon has to be accelerated to a higher energy to achieve the same range of penetration. But you notice that the structure of the Bragg peak is different. The proton is rather broad, but it comes down very nicely to a very low dose on the other side. The carbon, on the other hand, is very pristine peak. And unfortunately, it has a little tail, we call it the tail dose, from the fragmentation that goes on in the absorbing material upstream. So this is the tail of the proton and carbon story. And it's these two beams which our country and the world have been focusing on, and I'm going to tell you more about why. I have to tell you that when I first started using the Bevelac, it wasn't too reliable. And one day I prepared a whole set of biological flasks to be irradiated. And um, they came to tell me that they couldn't deliver the beam but once to me for each beam. And I was going to do a whole curve with each of, of data. So I said, OK, let me take my flask and I put Polaroid film between them, covering the range of 15 centimeters in depth behind a collimator. And uh, these are the Polaroids I developed later. It was the only outcome of the experiment that had to be planned later. But it tells the story of what's the difference between proton and carbon. You see they're both very, uh, very sharp edges on the collimation, right behind the collimation. But out here at 15 centimeters in depth into a patient, this carbon is just still crisp, but this proton is a fuzzy tennis ball. And so obviously the dose distribution if you had a tumor in the center of your brain is harder physics to achieve the same crisp dose profile. And also the lateral, lateral edge is sharper as well. So I'm just going to give you a potpourri of some of these uh, gifts of the carbon that is why people are so interested in it. Here's a comparison of photons where you see the poor depth dose situation where even though the tumor is here, you actually give a higher dose to the overlying tissues with this photons, unless you use fancy tricks. And even then, you, it's not as effective. But the sharp, very sharp Bragg peak isn't realistic for tumors. Most tumors are not that tiny, unfortunately. When we discover them, they are bigger. You must broaden the peak. And you do that by accumulating a number of different Bragg peaks that spread out here. So this is a compilation of like 20 different Bragg peaks of range to get a coverage of this cancer. And what you see is if you normalize the dose at the entrance, there is a differential here that I spoke of earlier, where the protons would seem to be better because the dose is lower, right, exactly on the other side. 
And if you had a spinal cord that was placed there, for example, in a spinal cord tumor, it would want be very advantageous. However, the carbon reaches a higher effective dose, and we're going to talk about that. This is um, the biological effect that's been pl plotted here, but you can't actually measure that with an instrument. You can only measure the physical dose. And so that's why they need biologists like uh, the group of us who worked with them. And we had the privilege of having all of these ranges and stocking powers available to us in this two uh, three-dimensional plot that you can see. The texture tells you uh, you have to go to increasing energies to get heavier and heavier ions. So what Dr. Tobias told me after I walked in the door was, your job, Ellie, is to figure out which beam is the best one for radiotherapy. And I have to tell you today, we still don't know exactly the answer. <laughs> but <coughs> what I did was I picked four beams, and I studied them, carbon, neon, silicon, and argon. And I looked at the ratio, depending on whether they were on low energy, 308, increased to 400 to 474. And what you see, as you go deeper and deeper, the peak to plateau ratio decreases. So that's disadvantageous. You want to keep the peak up there as much as you can. And with a heavier ion like neon, it's even more acute. And with um, silicon and argon, it is too. So what I then did was I took a four centimeter spread out by the peak, as we call them, which was deliberately sloped to a lower dose at the distal edge because we knew already it had a higher effectiveness because of the stopping ion discharge there. So we were trying to achieve an ISO effectiveness. So we designed the slope to give uniform killing across the bright peak. So this was a four centimeter, and this was a 10 centimeter because you get different answers on the relative effectiveness depending on the size of the tumor. So there are a lot of variables here. I hope you're keeping track of me. So I started out doing um, physics and saw that when I went off, off uh, uh, axis, the doses were different for the proton, also because of the problem of the fuzzy tennis ball. But with carbon, it didn't matter. The physics of carbon was really superior on the central axis and seven millimeters off axis. So I did a series of what we call survival curves it, with a human fibroblast line that was very stable over many years. It wasn't a normal tumor cell line, but it was stable. And what I, in this example, comparing carbon and argon, I'm going to just illustrate the most important take-home message of these experiments, which really represented about five years of work. And what we did was we did them in air and in nitrogen. In other words, I put the cells in a monolayer in a chamber where I could outgas the oxygen. Because oxygen, it turns out, is highly significant because of reactive oxygen species to causing the effects of these beams. And if you are devoid of oxygen, you get a much res more resistant um, um, survival. And unfortunately, the tumors are smart enough to figure that out. They actually outgrow their circulation, so you get patches of necrotic and even anoxic tissues in a tumor, which make this a very effective treatment um, for carbon. Because in the plateau, it has the ratio of bits that's large, but in the peak, it comes together. So when these two curves come together and they spread out peaks, and if you have a pristine beam, they actually almost are it's together completely. But in the spread out bag peak where you have a range of beams that have been accumulated, they get closer. So that means in that situation with high LAT, whether oxygen is present or not, beams are effective. And that's a really important feature. Now, when we went to Argon, we found we were over the hill. What does that mean? That means that this ratio is like this one in the entrance. So that worked against us. In the depth dose profile, you want this effect in the profile in the entrance, not this effect. So we dismissed argon off the bat because it was already very effective, at, especially at the distal edge, but it was too toxic at the beginning of the beam. So we had to eliminate it. So uh, long story short, um, I plotted ratios of oxygen effect and also RDE, where I did similar studies. And instead of a hypoxic curve, I used photons. And then I can make a ratio we call relative biological effectiveness. And what I found using a quality factor um, 
we call LET, linear energy transfer, which is basically the ionizations per unit track. And it's in units of KEV per micrometer. What happens when the RBE goes up to about a factor of three with each of these beams, the uh, OER comes down. So the reduction in the oxygen effect was dependent on the LAT. Is that clear? Please don't hesitate to interrupt me because I sometimes go off the deep end. Um, but what also this shows is these three beams, neon, argon, and silicon, each form a different curve on the other side of this peak, which means that is there, at the same LAT, you can have different RBEs. So LAT is actually not such a good parameter for us to use, but we'll talk about other options instead. And the most important thing you need to understand is when a doctor treats a tumor, they're trying to protect the normal tissue. So they have a factor they call the normal tissue control probability, and then they have the tumor control probability. And what they're looking for is the golden ratio here they call a therapeutic index, where they can eradicate 90% or almost 90% of the tumor without doing damage to the normal tissue. So that ratio is really key. Just keep that in mind. So now I'm going to show you a simple-minded little plot I made after I finished all this work using plus signs, where it met uh, one, two, or three uh, indications. So I compared the high MET advantage looking at these three parameters, the depth dose, the RDE, or the OER, for protons, helium, plants, and neutrons, and these four heavy ions. And what we saw was the physical depth dose of the Bragg peak is very excellent. I showed you the sharp sort of broad peak, but still very uh, sharp proton bright peak. Helium is like that, and ions, but not for neutrons. Neutrons are another high LAT source, but they have a very poor depth dose profile. But with regard to the ions, this carbon was just like the proton, as you saw when I plotted them together, but more pristine, tighter peak, even though it had a tail dose. Neon was similar, and silicon was lower and argon was poor. So we actually dropped off using those two ions because of this data set. The RBE in this case is not present for protons. People have been treated, all those thousands of people, assuming an RBE of 1.1. Turns out now we know that it could be higher than that beyond in the peak than has been appreciated before. So RBE is not reduced either by helium or pions barely by neutrons, but there's a gradient of increase of the RBE as we get to higher and higher uh, ions. And so carbon and neon were the selection that we were picking because we didn't want the silicon and argon because of the poor depth dose. And finally, when we looked at the oxygen enhancement ratio, there is no difference um, for protons. It does not kill hypoxic cells. Uh, and helium is modest, and so is ions. And neutrons, though, were very good at reducing the oxygen effect. And carbon was OK, neon was better. So we actually ended up using neon for most of our clinical work. Uh, a recent publication by a, a manufacturer of accelerators. Yes? Yeah, so I'm always curious, when I said I talks about this, why yeah. is helium, so why not helium? Helium is now being considered and being used even for CT scanning instead of using photons. So uh, it's now being reconsidered. It was a, um, not uniformly available. People didn't have access to it, but now groups in Italy and other in Germany and Japan are using helium as well. And it turns out that the, um, the beam doesn't have the bad features I mentioned already about photon. Helium is more like carbon in terms of the fuzzy ball problem. But that's a good point. Thank you. So this manufacturer, he tried to make the OER RBE story simpler. He made this plot where a higher ratio is better. So for x-rays, the OER is poor. Carbon, it's better, but these are too much. And then for carbon, it's sort of like, just like the, the porridge, you know, the three bears story. Just right in the middle of your carbon. Now, the accelerator that I've been telling you about was the Lenny Orange accelerator where we did helium work, and the Bevatron was here, but we also had the Super Highlight, which was up the mountain, and Dr. Giorso decided that we should link this Lenac to um, this machine and make a Bevelac. That's how the name Bevelac came about, it was a hybrid. 
And it was that feature that allowed us to get to the higher energies that we needed by having the ions tumble down the hill. And you could even drive under the beam pipe. <laughs> I just want to show you, because you may not have seen uh, perhaps a CT scan of a head. This is a, to simulate a patient with a tumor midline in the, in the head, in the cranium. And what's on the left is photon treatment planning, where it's color wash. The color designates the dose. Red, hot colors are high dose. Blue, cold, means less than 10%. So here is a side view um, to also to show you that the problem with photons is here you do get the same coverage of the tumor that you would with the carbon beam as shown here. But um, you get all this additional dose that is not necessary. Yes? Is this an eclipse? Uh, say that again? Is this an eclipse? Is this an eclipse? No. The treatment planning system? No, it, that's one of the programs that was used, but this was an old one, which would be for eclipse. But okay. Before I'm sorry, eclipse. I pulled out from the old, but that's a very good program. Um, so the, the field of medical physics is extremely important, and we need people trained in, in physics and engineering and a, high, a background in nuclear engineering to look into these treatment planning programs, because this is very important. When you actually look here, you can actually see that if the blue is less, the green, the soft, softer colors are less, and the treatment plan is better for the patient. So here's the RSO where you connected the two machines. I already explained that to you. Oops. And what we had to do was hold the patient. The patient couldn't sneeze, for example, because that would really foul us up. We would have dose where we wouldn't want it. So we had to make a, a plastic mask which held the bony structures of the person's head. And we, they were okay with it because it was, we made it clear plexiglass and they didn't get so claustrophobic. And so in this case, the patient was held in position like this during the treatment. This is Dr. Joseph Castro, who was the clinician in charge of the program with another gentleman, Dr. Uh, Ted Phillips, and uh, also Dr. Quibby. And George Chen was a treatment planner and I was the biologist. This was years ago now. And I'm telling you this story quickly, as you can see. So I'm just going to the bottom line of what clinical results we obtained at Berkeley Lab and before they shut the machine in 92 uh, because of uh, cost. Um, we actually compared our clinical results with neon, with neutrons and x-rays to, to give you some basis of comparison. These are the tumors that responded the best to our treatments with neon. They include the macroscopic salivary gland, which still remains today the best treated tumor site that we have for carbon ion therapy. We had 61% response that was positive, and these were very advanced patients, so that's a really significant number. And it was comparable to what the neutron people had already reported, and more than doubled what you get with photons. The paranasal sinus microscopic uh, cancers were also in that category with similar numbers. We also treated sarcomas, which are bone tumors, and they can appear anywhere in your body, unfortunately. We had 56%, uh, which is what the neutrons, and again, it was in the 30s to 40s um, or 50s for, for photons. The macroscopic uh, sarcoma of the bone was like that too. And finally, the tumor that we treated successfully was locally advanced prostate cancer. And we had 75% responders, which was very uh, encouraging because these people many times had been treated with other modalities that had failed before we got to them. And this was also comparable to neutrons. The high LET element comparing neutrons and neon was very significant compared to the photons. When we closed the Bevelac, um, which was a very sad thing, the Japanese had been coming for years to visit us every month. And they built in 1994, and it opened in 94, so it took them 10 years to build it. The super Cadillac of the Bevelac. <laughs> they, they actually could accelerate ions, uh, very heavy ions, to very long ranges. And the reason they did that was an interest in space uh, physics and biology, which is also relevant to this story that I'm telling you. So they called their machine the HIMAC, for heavy ion particle accelerator in Chiba, which is the city near Tokyo where the machine was placed. It could accelerate helium to argon. 
up to 800 NEP per nuclear for each. It had three treatment rooms. One was a fixed vertical. One was fixed horizontal. And then they had a room where both this and this were present, that they could do a dual beam. The energies were, that were used were these, and the range of carbon and water were these. And they used a 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter field. Question? That's a pretty big field. I mean, it's pretty big. Actually, 20 by 20 is more common. Mm -hmm. But uh, doesn't that get uh, our our tumors that big? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. When you first start doing this work, I have to explain to you that NCI has a program they call Phase 1, 2, 3 Trials. So when you start a new modality that you have never tested before like we did, they make you start with phase one, where you get patients who have been given up on any other treatment, sometimes failed other treatments. And if you show any measure of success, like we did, then you move on to phase two, where they put them a little closer in age and tumor situation to make the comparison. But it's not till you get the gold standard in the Western world of the phase three randomized trial, where the patient draws a straw and finds out which modality, the gold standard of the photon or this new beam, but the problem with us is that it's very obvious which one they get when they come up, drive up to an accelerator. So many of them refuse to be randomized. That's another issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, these protocols and timelines, I won't go through the detail, show the progress that the Japanese had from 94 until 2010. And I just came back a week and a half ago from Japan again, where there were 196 people from 15 countries who are working in this field to optimize these protocols in terms of dose per fraction and overall treatment time. So they had 57 phase one and phase two protocols uh, at this point in time to, uh, by 2010. And I also want to just anchor in that you understand that when you measure uh, a carbon beam, can you see the green? And you see the survival. Um, it looks like this. It's actually the effective survival is uh, higher because of the RBE effect. So the physics only measures the physical dose. You have to fold in the RBE when you do the treatment planning. And it's a much bigger effect than this. So instead of physics like this, you have to use the physics like this to know the effectiveness. OK, so. Um, the LET and RBE of the carbon ions that the Japanese used were fitting in very nicely with the papers that we had published here at Berkeley. And they noticed that in the distal edge, it was equivalent to fast neutrons. And they had a many year uh, experience of treating patients with neutrons. So that helped them actually planning clinically how to respond to these patients. And it really matters a lot, the edge of margin with the tumor and the normal tissue. And that is a very particular issue we'll talk about here. So again, the dose per fraction of the physical dose is the Bragg curve here that's spread out with the distal edge being sloped to reduce to, so that you get an ISO effect. The biological effect actually is the RBE folded in. But in addition, they use what they called clinical judgment, which was a little bit of subjective, to uh, fold in an RBE. And it was with caution. They were trying to do this. So they actually even though we irradiated the first carbon patient, they actually did a full clinical trial with carbon. And they used, uh, after consulting with me actually, <laughs> their human salivary gland tumor, at which became a significant later, I'll tell you in a minute. And they were using simple linear quadratic models to predict what the effects would be in their treatment planning. And um, they scaled it usually with an RBE of about three. They later updated this using a model called the MKM, um, Microscopic Kinetic Model. And it had something to do with their understanding of the size of the targeted lesion and DNA damage. And they showed beautiful data um, with this model. <coughs> and just in the interest of time, they treated a um, different array of tumors than we did at Berkeley. They treated prostatis, which was in common with us. They also treated lung, which was a challenge because the, when you have a lung tumor and you breathe, which we all need to breathe, then your, your tumor is moving. It's a moving target. 
So what they would do is put a transducer on the diaphragm of the patient, triggered to deep inhalation or deep exhalation, and then they would only release the beam when it was in that position. Mm -hmm. So not every pulse was used to treat, only when it, with the beam and the tumor was in the right position. So they also used some more abdominal uh, tumors, liver, rectum, uterus, <coughs> pancreas, and including the eye, which we also treated with the melanoma, skull base, esophagus, lymph nodes, and lacrimal gland. They, um, it rolled a large number, and they're very meticulous in keeping track of these patients, so they have tremendous follow-up period. They also benefited from their country's health insurance program. And this is one thing I'd like to just punch home here, is that for their patients, it's about 3 million Japanese yen per patient. In our country, the costing to the insurance company is per fraction. In our country, they feel you know a patient may not survive all the fractions necessary. Usually, 30 or more fractions were being used for patients with photons. So they actually began with research money from Japan, the blue bars. And when they finally, in 2003, showed such remarkable clinical results, which I'm going to touch upon in a minute here, the orange bars kicked in. So then they got coverage from their insurance company. So this is a difference in our countries that makes the difference and is the reason underlying why the United States does not have a carbon emission. So the importance of the dose per fraction cannot be overstated. The evidence with the neutron beams and carbon ions indicated that increasing the dose per fraction lowers the RBE of both the tumor and the normal tissue, but the RBE of the tumor did not decrease as rapidly as the RBE of the normal tissue. So these data corroborated the promise that the therapeutic ratio, which remember we discussed earlier, could increase with hypofractionation, less fractions, but bigger doses each, were used for carbon. And hypofractionation is what they contributed significantly to. They did, started with uh, fewer and fewer and fewer. For lung tumors, now they can cure with a single fraction. That is also possible because in Japan, they have a higher screening of lung tumors. They still check for TB in adults. And then they pick up the early disease. So it's those young tumors that are able to be eradicated with a single dose of carbon. So, it, but you have to be careful with, to know what you're doing when you increase the dose per fraction because it's more toxic if you, and if you make sure you have to get it where you want it and in a narrow or therapeutic window. But the benefit is that the patient doesn't have to come as often to the clinic. There's similar effects, similar toxicity, and it's much more friendly to the patient. Um, so, in all I tried to summarize briefly here, just in a few slides for you, that they've really gotten down to most tumors, except the lung, are 16 fractions in four weeks, like the salivary gland tumor that I started with. And the tumors they've treated successfully include head and neck lesions, large skull-based cancers, which are wrapped around the spinal cord, inoperable sarcoma, post-op recurrent rectal, re-irradiation after photon uh, radiotherapies that have failed. They have some promising results in lung liver nodules, where they do have a small fraction number. And also, the significant one that has drawn the attention of our Congress, finally, is the pancreatic uh, cancer uh, outcome. It, in our country, nine months is, is usually the time they give you from diagnosis to live after you've been diagnosed with this disease. They have patients out four or five years. And also high-risk prostate is successful. So the clinical studies at the, at the Japanese facility, they, at this point, they'd only had 10,000. Of, of the 20,000, they had irradiated more than uh, 10,000 of them in 60 protocols, and they optimized a number of physical and, bi and biological parameters to hypofractionate, and they showed better control and survival compared to regular plastic photon treatment. And they also developed a smaller machine, because what they realized was driving the cost of these machines up was its size. The footprint wouldn't fit in a typical uh, clinic for radiotherapy. So I'm going to talk about that again, too. Um, now, two weeks ago, or so I, they tell me they have seven machines operating in these cities. Uh, and they, I was visiting the city of Saga, 
in Tosu, and it was uh, amazing. They are very meticulous. They're building smaller footprint machines, and and their government has decided with their population that this they may go up to ten, and we don't have any. I remember that part. <laughs> Now, I, I don't have time to I have pictures of all of the facilities, but I know you don't want to see my pictures. So I'm going to just show you one or two more. This is the Heidelberg facility in Germany. I had a chance to work there myself briefly. And this is Professor Debus, who's the director. Professor Kraft came to, for two years to work in my lab before they began the work. And then he did the biology and physics. And um, Thomas Haberer also was involved. So they have, a, the reason I have this picture for you is unlike the Japanese who used our passive particle be spreading beams, where we would s use fragmentation to make the field bigger, they figured out that it would be better to use a gantry where you would paint the dose on the tumor by buster scanning it. Only problem was it cost, I mean, it's a 600 ton machine. And they call it the elephant, actually. But <laughs> they, they, um, they have three different caves, or, or treatment rooms, depending on what you call them, where the beam would come. And the benefit of this is the doctor can use any 360 degree access. He just rotates the gantry, to, and the patient doesn't even know it exists. He's in a room that this is uh, sheltered from him. So all they see is this spout beam with the spout with the beam coming out at any angle the doctor wishes. Here's a close up of the 600 ton gantry, and here's a man standing next to it. So not many people, this is the only one in the world. The Japanese have now built one that's a third of this weight and does nearly the same thing with um, superconducting uh, magnets. This is how it looks to be a patient treated there, similar to what we had, although I think they should have used clear. Anyway, um, and the beam, this rotates to accommodate um, patient's conditions. So, but they, because of having the gantry, yes, how long are the patients uh, in that mask for? Like, how long yeah, that's a really good question. They are um, adapted. It, it pre they have a room where they prepare them before they get in the queue to go into the treatment room. So they have that period, which is probably less than an hour, because the treatment itself was only two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was the preparation, which has to be so exquisitely careful, that was taking most of the time. But they have throughput. They have hundreds of patients a day now that they do. But their tumors, by the way, oh, by and large, were more in the head and neck region, unlike the Japanese, which treated the body. That, interestingly enough. So you say, okay, why why are we going from proton to carbon? I'm just going to summarize now. I've told you that the precision therapy is more conformal to the tumor. There's more sparing of normal tissue. There's increased DNA damage in the tumor because the beam that gets there does more damage than a photon. And I'm going to explain about that in a bit. And there's an increased killing of hypoxic tumors. There's also less repair. You can shorten the course of treatment. And you also have a neat little trick that a radioactive beam of a very short half-life is created, usually carbon-11, that can guarantee the proof of where you put the beam. You put them in a PET scanner after the treatment, and bingo, you see where the beam went. So, that kind of um, verification is very valuable. So back in the 80s when we were working on most of this, the goal was to identify what's the best beam for maximizing the dose to the tumor while sparing the surrounding normal tissue. The criteria we used, which I draped you through, the biological models and the simple treatment plans, we were measuring little things like RBE, a bioeffects compared to photon, and also OER. Now, the goal has changed in 2018. The goal now is to evaluate, quote, still the best clinical implementation, but they've narrowed in on these two charged particle modalities, proton or carbon, for maximizing the dose to the tumor while sparing surrounding normal tissues. And in particular, for kid, uh, pediatric cases, there's a big concern whether to go to carbon or should it only be proton. But because the physics I showed you for the carbon is so superior, there already are many places treating pediatric patients with carbon. Uh, other intermediate ions, the, like the gentleman who asked the human question, lithium and boron are also under consideration, for also perhaps for pediatric patients. And now the criteria have changed. Uh, we don't have simple systems. We now have new physical dose old standards. 
Um, actually, SBRT is the most recent, but image-guided radiotherapy with photons is taking a copy, the copy of what we've done. A big part of what is needed for this kind of therapy is imaging, and that's also adding to the cost. But now the people who do photon work have figured that out, that that is something they should do. So they're actually not only doing IGRT or, or SBRT, all these different names they give to that, but they also are um, uh, trying to do hypofractionation as well, and, and I can tell you about that. We, plus now we know a lot more about the biological models and what questions we can ask, and we have a new understanding about treatment planning models and new molecular tubes tools to probe the mechanisms of action. So one thing to take away from my presentation is that it's all about the tracks. That's what's different between photons and particles. If you compare like protons and neon at the same LET, the ion beam with the lower charge, which would be the proton, has a lower velocity and smaller track radius compared to the beam with a higher atomic number, which would have to be 377 and maybe per atomic mass unit for neon. So more energy is deposited by the lower energy proton in a smaller target volume. But more target molecules are hit by the higher energy neon beam due to the delta ray, which proceeds to come out radially. This leads to both qualitative and quantitative target differences, damage and repair. These are particle motion tracks from Dr. Heckman. Um, and they show like the beam is coming in from the left and going to the stopping point at the right. And these are, you know, silver emulsions, so you can't imagine the side effects. So I'm gonna, I have a sketch to show you what it looks like. Um, it, it, there's this core, which is very dense ionization, but then you have these zinging uh, penumbra delta rays that pop out that actually contribute also to a mixed LAT, even though you're treating with high LAT, it's a mixed range of LAT. So the cross-section looks like this with the delta rays, and you have to plan that. But when that kind of structure crosses a DNA molecule, like a chromatin fiber of 30 nanometers, the carbon ion, it looks like a bottle brush cleaner for a baby bottle uh, brush. And it makes a lot of damage because each one of those dark lines crosses and breaks bonds and uh, does a lot of damage to the DNA molecule. The protons and photons are down here, very sparse bottle brush. There's hardly any way you could clean a baby's bottle with that. <laughs> And as you go up in LET, it gets thicker and thicker. And that's the difference. Um, so what happens along the track are that you create reactive oxygen species, ROS. And the oxidative species that are distinctive from, that are produced by high LET are not the same as low LET. This leads to all those endpoints I told you about, including new things like immune response is different or chronic inflammation and uncertainties at low dose. So here is just, again, another summary by Dr. Sterling and Loeffler in 2010, where the right peak is here and showing comparison between the energy, whether it's high energy or low energy, the LET is low or high. You get differences in cell cycle effects through the uh, dividing cell, cell as it progresses, in fractionation, in angiogenesis, and even cell migration. So there are many biological advantages I had to sort of gloss over here, but any one of them would make a presentation to you, a full presentation. So the key targets are DNA bases and genes, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, mitochondria, blood cells. Membrane receptor cell adhesion molecules are different, extracellular matrix, immune stem, and endothelial cells. All of these endpoints now have given us an explosion of information about this field. And what are the key features to take home? That high LET damage is clustered. It's grouped in those bottle brush lines I showed you. That they cause persistent mutations and chromosome aberrations. They reduce the ability of a cell to repair its DNA. Causes drastic alterations in cell progression. It pre when you uh, dump out proteins called cytokines, which are inflammatory, that is enhanced in this activation. Also, tumors, uh, you'd think if it, you get higher effectiveness, you might also get tumors. Well, I'm actually working on a project for NASA to ask that question for safety for the astronauts that I could talk to you about sometime. This, uh, also, the way a cell dies is very diverse with high LAT. 
You all know apoptosis, autophagy, senescence, mitotic catastrophe, and necrosis. And the ratios of each of these different forms of mortality are different depending on the LAT. There is altered gene expression and differentiation through um, maturation of the tissues. The cells communicate differently, and they move differently, and blood vessels are formed differently. I'm winding down here, but you need to know that the theoretical biophysical modeling has been lumped into algorithms um, uh, that are linear quadratic, the old Kelleher model, the repair misrepair, and the LPL. But these newer amorphous track models, which are keyed into the particle track of dependence, I have also contributed to the development of, by the Germans of a, of a model called Local Effect Model, LEM. And actually, there's a version one, two, three, and four. They're currently treating with one, but they're going to progress to four. And they even have a FUCA version. And the Japanese, on, in contrast, unfortunately, are using the microscopic kinetic model, which uh, it actually is getting a difference it, uh, that I'm very distressed with. When I go to speak to my colleagues, it, is I always tell them, this is not a good thing because you're not using the same RBE. Not only do they use different models in each of those two countries, their analysis is different. And so Japan, as I just told you, uses the MKM and they use the in-house treatment planning system, but they're working to uh, a drop-down menu kind of approach. In Germany, the LEM was the in-house treatment planning system, but they're going to convert to LEM4 pretty soon. When the Italians started in Pavia, they didn't like either one, so they made their own hybrid because they couldn't create the same beam because they didn't have a gantry because they did a cheap machine. And the people in, in uh, Shanghai used the LEM model and in Austria using ray stations. So this is a weakness because it reduces the likelihood that good comparisons can be made clinically. So these microscopic dose distributions, for example, for a two-gray dose, here's x-ray. You just get a flat. There's no tracks in x-rays. And if you use a 1 MeV per micron, um, per uh, AMU carbon beam, you get these many tracks. And then 15 MeV per U, and then 200. And this is what is actually used um, in the, I'm um, sorry. Um, so the LEM assumes that local response is independent of the radiation quality. I really am almost done. Um, let's give this an interest of time. But I wanted to show you that, in fact, they've measured up to 20, 15 to 20 percent differences between the two models. So it's not a trivial aspect. So also, when you measure things at this dimension, there's an increasing scale, because what you have to apply it to is the treatment planning. And in all these changes of scale, there are losses of information. So there still remain issues to standardize this technology, and it requires a big question of how we are doing our internal sta international standards, which don't exist currently for carbon. Um, but it's still a new era for this field. We have the human genome mapped, and it's a very informationful set of data. We have powerful new genomic and proteomic tools. We can really focus now on individualized medicine and networks of gene and protein pathways have been identified that are unique. Uh, gene expression profiles are time dependent. 3D treatment planning uh, is, can be done, but the modeling still needs more support. So the open questions remain still the optimal particle species for each tumor type, the differential effects in tissue response, volume effects, secondary cancer induction, and individual sensitivity and immunological response. So basically the concept is to have a toolbox of all these ions, and the doctor might pull out the one he needs for a pediatric patient, or he may pull out something else for an aged patient. And um, that's the goal that we've been trying to settle, but I mean, in the meanwhile, we know a whole lot more about what cancer is, and I don't have time because I run over my time, but we, that we know now that cells talk to each other, and in that communication signaling, the talk, crosstalk is different for the different kinds of radiation, and I, I could tell you about that in very great detail. We've also found links between DNA damage and immune signaling in the genetic searches that have been done, which is very exciting. And then that precipitated, a, actually, one picture I'm going to show you of a patient who had a very uh, 
painful tumor right here on the side. And it was um, apparently aortic lymph node metastases. And the, he had also other metastatic disease. So they decided, this is the PET scan, so you can see the tumor is definitely there. This is after treatment of this lesion, all the other lesions in the body disappear from a carb. So it means that the immune response, this can happen in some phenomena just with immune response by itself. But it turns out when you irradiate a tumor, it releases an antigen. And if you can then trigger the break that the cancer puts on your immune system off, then your own body can fight the tumor. And you don't need anything more than one tumor to like treat it. It's really exciting to do that. I'm sorry I've gone over. So um, we have a lot of research to do. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, I do think this approach is participating in development of personalized medicine, working with multidisciplinary teams, taking advantage of the vast sets of data that are being accumulated. And my conclusion and summary is that conventional radiobiology and pioneering clinical practice has shown proton and carbon ion beams are each potentially useful for tumor radiotherapy, dependent on the details of the clinical application. Helium oxygen and neon may also have a role for either radiosensitive or radioresistant tumors. Further modern molecular research in vivo with all ions between um, proton and neon is needed in, in, to inform us of these underlying mechanisms and we need to reduce the size of the carbon footprint. Now I think what I'm going to do, I do have a little part here which I'm not going to drag you through <laughs> to tell you a little bit more, but I should tell you that the NIH is open to funding some of this work. And so my closing is to show you a paper by um, the, from the, uh, Dr. Coleman, who's in charge of radiation therapy, and the areas that he thinks initiatives would be very uh, happily accepted for funding in the charged particle world, world. And this is such a change of, of, of approach for us to have this mission for the United States that it's refreshing. And also, the combination with the immune response is one of the drivers. So um, I think you should just know at the end that in our country, what happened in 2013 was they did call the meeting. They finally realized that all the world was doing carbon ions that we invented and we didn't have it. So this is what precipitated the change in the mission. And so they made a call for proposals they call planning grants. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. I'm almost there. And it said what happened was um, we and Berkeley were one of the two groups that were funded. I was one of three PIs on the one funded here. And what we're doing is uh, looking to make smaller the footprint of the machine. So I'm actually working with some of the laser physicists to have an alternative source of ions because there's a new phenomenon also called flash radiotherapy, which we could talk about differently. But it's very exciting. But since I've already held you here longer than I should have, I apologize. I want to thank you for your attention. Even though we're beyond time, I think um, if there are any questions, feel free to leave. This is a uh, Real quick, you mentioned it only takes two minutes for one treatment. What kind of beam current are you using to do that? Or how many particles per yeah, second? We're in the 10 to the 9. 10 to the 9th particles? Pul yes, per pulse. 10 and 9 part per pulse. pulse. And how frequent are the pulses? At 15 per minute. I can do the math. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm sorry, if you um, want to reach me, I'm eablakely at lbl.gov. So feel free to email me. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you.